Hey, welcome all you wiretappers out there. It's good to be back here in the studio of Gangland Wire. We are going up to Canada today. I have here Peter Edwards with the Toronto Star. He covers the mafia. We don't have that anymore down in the United States. We don't have reporters seem like just focused on the mob anymore, but they've still got a pretty active family up there. So, Peter, Rob, really welcome. I really appreciate you coming on the show. And I'm going to come up and, and visit Canada here in about a month from the time I record this. So I wanted to have this ready to go whenever I go up and come back to Canada. So welcome, Peter. Oh, thanks for having me. So Peter, tell us a little bit about yourself, about your books and your job covering the mob. What's that like? So I, I've been at the Toronto Star for a long, long time, and I've specialized in organized crime. I've done, I think, a dozen books on organized crime, including an encyclopedia with another reporter, Michelle Auger, who actually was shot by the Hells Angels, very brave guy from Montreal. And then I've done six other books on other topics. We see a lot of connections. Like I'm constantly talking to people in Vancouver or Montreal, even though I'm in Toronto, because a lot of our organized crime people bounce around between the cities or they subcontract someone from another city so that it's harder to trace them down. Mm -hmm. And so with the internet, what we're finding is that the old mob families, they Montreal was like a banana city. The old mob families, if they want to do well, they've got to work with these newcomers, and there's a lot of newcomers. So we're getting all these alliances now. It's not as strict family lines as it used to be. Interesting. Yeah. If I remember, it was the Catronis, and were like a Sicilian family, and then the Rizzuto, Vito Rizzuto, and his crew took over. Kind of bring us up to date, kind of a little bit of the history of the Sicilian mafia in Canada. So in, in the 1950s, a guy, Carmen Galenti, came up from New York. He's a really tough guy with a pretty serious ambitions. He organized the Montreal mob a fair bit. There was one guy, Vic Catroni. He was the eldest of a group of brothers. He took Vic under his wing. Vic was Calabrian, but he got along with Sicilians. And New York City is more Sicilian. A lot of Canada is more Calabrian, especially around Toronto. Vic Catroni was smart enough to adapt to get along with Galenti, which meant getting along with the Bananos. When Vic eventually passed on, the Rizzutos took over, and the Rizzutos are Sicilian a lot more. Things got pretty nasty at that point. There was quite a bit of killing. Vito Rizzuto, who was the big mob guy up here for a long, long time, I'm very good at corruption. I'm very good at infiltrating the system. He ended up going to prison in the States for his role in three murders in New York. And when he got out, there was a big fight for control with the Montreal mob again. Yeah, that was so interesting when I first learned that, that they bring this mob guy down from Canada, from Montreal, to participate. And arguably one of the, at the time, one of the most dramatic and biggest murders in mob history in New York City. I mean, before Paul Castellano, the murder of the three capos, that was huge. That was like unbelievably huge to do that. They'd never done anything like that before. Bring this guy, I guess maybe they brought him down to help kind of like keep things confused. The mob always likes to keep things confusing for law enforcement. I don't know if you've ever noticed that, but they like to throw a lot of stuff out in the game and keeps everybody off balance a little bit and confusing. I just was amazed that they brought a guy down from Montreal to do that. Yeah, we're finding that now too. I mean, that's what I'll be working on this week and the next week because there's a lot of subcontracting so the mob will want someone bumped off but they'll contract a street gang guy to do it and the street gang guy might not even know the full scope of what he's doing he's just killing someone for a generally not as much money as the other ones would charge and we're getting montreal mob guys hiring street gang guys in toronto mm -hmm. to do things for them a lot more crossover meanwhile the hell's angels have risen up at the start they were like the guys who did the heavy lifting for the mob now they, they'd be equal like now the hell's angels are just as big of a deal as the mob in my opinion oh really wow that's amazing how does that work between the two the hell's angels historically were a bunch of thugs or crappy clothes i mean that was part of their thing was to have the dirtiest clothes of anybody and look the scruffiest or on the other hand the mafia guys they're always like look clean and squared away. Back in the day, they wore suits and gold jewelry and everything. How did they ever get together like that? And the Hells Angels seem so uncontrolled where the mob is so controlled. It's funny because the Hells Angels 
like that scruffy image, but they're a lot more structured than you'd think. Their image is actually copyrighted. If you published their winged death head without their permission, you'd be sued for a copyright infringement. They, oh, really? um, <laughs> Their name, you couldn't have Hell's Angels ice cream without being sued. They're actually pretty litigious. They like the tough image because it gets some people to underestimate them and some people scares them. And it was true back in the 60s and 70s. And Hunter S. Thompson wrote a great book about them. Yeah. But the ones we have now, they're, oh, I'm looking at cybercrime. I'm looking at those guys. I'm looking at lots of things involving the internet, those guys. I'm looking at shipping through the port of Montreal. And if they aren't doing it, they're kind of allowing it to be done or thinking about doing it. There are parts of Canada that don't have a really big actual mafia. And so people who normally would be inclined to go into the mafia, go into the Hells Angels. There's a kind of a wing of the different gangs in BC who if they had been brought up in Ontario, would have gone into the mob, but instead went into biker groups. Interesting. They don't really ride motorcycles. Like the motor, <laughs> a lot of these guys don't know any more about motorcycles than my grandmother did. Yeah, you got a pretty short riding season up there in Canada. I ride motorcycles. and <laughs> You got a real short riding season up there in Canada. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's like a symbol. It's funny, though, they like the idea of looking undisciplined, but if you look at their vests, you can tell a huge amount about them they've got to have different patches in different places it's very militaristic the hell's angels actually came out of returning servicemen after world war ii and their rivals the banditos came out of the vietnam war so mm. there's an undercurrent that's very very militaristic about them and they'll look you in the face when they say something the quebec hell's angels are for Canada, the most fearsome ones. I had a Ontario Hells Angel once when I was talking to him, and he said, if it's just me and you, we can talk. If it's me and you and guys from Ontario, watch your mouth. If it's me and you and guys from Quebec, don't look at me. <laughs> and because Quebec has that image, you really don't want them mad at you. And a lot of people from other provinces go to Quebec when Quebec needs heavy lifting or sort of deeper thinking. There's one guy I'm looking at now whose place was burned down a couple of weeks ago, and he went from Ontario, which is kind of in the interior, off to Montreal, and it's really because they needed a smart, tough guy. So primarily, what I've seen over the years in past is they're big into strip clubs and girls, but they've gone off into all kinds of white collar crime. It sounds to me like they still do the strip clubs. They still kind of like the people that supply the girls and run all that in the strip clubs. Yeah, but then that's something you can get caught on to. Like the guy was just talking about, he had a strip club, but he actually lost his liquor license, which is the only thing they made stick against him. He was charged <laughs> with uh, gambling. Gambling is a really big one. Like right now, there's a fight between the mob in Ontario and the mob in Quebec and the Hells Angels are right in the thick of it. And that's over gambling. Gambling is the big thing. You're going to make a lot more money off gambling than some girl dancing around a pole. Interesting. So is there like a particular figure? How the Hells Angels in Canada, it's organized by province or by city and they have chapters and so it's funny because a lot of the chapters are in university towns if there's a town with two universities there's going to be a hell's angels chapter uh -huh. and generally fairly well off places and a couple of weeks ago they had a national run where they forced them all together but it's kind of like an awkward family picnic where people don't always get along and so <laughs> but it is a bit of a chance to mingle police love those things because it's a chance yeah. for them to see who's on the way up who's on the way down who's getting more respect than who else i'm very very interested in who's working on the docks, who has control of the docks. There's uh -huh. a lot of stolen car theft up here, and I'm trying to find out how much these guys are, are doing in that. Interesting. So each chapter kind of stands on its own, whereas like the mafia will have these different families and then maybe have a commission that will settle. Do they have anything like that? Not really. It's supposed to be not a pyramid, and the mafia is more of a pyramid, especially the Sicilian mafia. Right. The, Hell's Angels are supposed to be equals and that you can count, you don't cheat another Hell's Angel or else you're really in trouble. So if I need help in a different area, I can reach out. And if they don't help me, they at least have to be respectful. It means you've passed a certain clearance, like you're probably more reliable than someone else. But you don't have to work with people. You just need six members to set up a chapter. And then there's a lot of support club people, like people who want to get into the club, who do a lot of the heavy lifting and the dirty jobs. So they're the ones who get arrested generally. 
interesting. Like, a lot like the mob. Mob has associates. They have prospects. <laughs> so it's there's a lot of similarities in there. Yeah, except you can't pick your family members. Like if you've got an idiot oh, really? nephew, you, yeah, he's sort of a, a problem forever. But with the bikers, they peel them off a lot and they're pretty ruthless about if someone rises up, they'll peel off a lot of their rivals in the club and they say they're out in bad standing and they'll accuse them of talking to police or something. And so yeah. a couple of years ago, the young ones were ascending and they booted out a lot of the old ones who didn't like the internet. Like uh, the old ones were kind of looking down their noses and thinking they're spoiled little kids. And they thought these guys are dinosaurs. And so they just booted them out. <laughs> That's interesting. That's that like happens in companies. I know I saw it happen on the police department here in Kansas City. All of a sudden we have new breed takes over most of the management positions and they start cracking on some of the older guys who had these ways about them. And, and they even start calling themselves dinosaurs and, and they start yeah. retiring off pretty quick. <laughs> Yeah, and you can just make life difficult for somebody. And there's some stuff you just yeah. can't prove. Like, how do you prove you're not talking to police? Yeah, right. You know, you can create a cloud around someone and then they're effectively gone. And then they get annoyed about this isn't worth paying the dues for. And, you know, I'm not paying money to hang around with people I don't like. But it's funny when they moved into Ontario, they sort of incorporated a lot of the existing clubs. And then once they incorporated them, they got rid of a lot of the members and brought in new guys into those spots. So now you're Italian traditional Italian crime families. You have the Drangheta, I think. Was that more in Toronto or Ontario? Just, these... just north of, yeah, that's the Toronto thing mostly. And just by immigration patterns in Montreal, it leans more towards Sicilian. And part of it, I think, is that New York is more Sicilian. And so it's sort of a natural, you'd be more comfortable in Montreal if you're a Sicilian mob guy than you would be I'm north of Toronto. But if you want to do well, you've got to get some sort of an alliance. Like you've got to get someone to cross over from the other side. And we're getting a lot more of that now where people aren't as strict about which side they're on. I see. Interesting. And so you go back to the French connection. That was Sicilian. That was, I think, Lucchese family. And it was Glante part of that, the French connection, when they brought the heroin in from Canada. I always wondered about the Canadian end of that, the Montreal end of that French connection heroin. Yeah, that was great. And that was a real thing. It wasn't something some screenwriter thought up. And you bring the heroin into Montreal and then drop it down to New York. And 385 miles, you can drive that in half a day. Yeah. So, And it's extremely hard to catch heroin when it's being smuggled. I mean, they can't catch SUVs when they're smuggled. They put them in containers and mm -hmm. you don't know what's in the container. So heroin's pretty much impossible. What's the border like? Is there a lot of back roads and ways to get across um, the border and avoid checkpoints or do they just do it like in out of mexico just have compartments and send a bunch of them through at one time and then most of them will get through you can do both and then they started sharing loads and so you get these alliances where instead of you putting all your hopes on one load you'll go in yeah. with four other groups and you'll all you have a fifth of each load and then with fentanyl if you do get caught you just juice it up with fentanyl and it's more dangerous but the buyers will buy it and so between the internet and that sort of thing it's forcing more alliances it's also extremely confusing for police because it used to be geography certain people were yeah. certain areas and now they might live there but with the internet everybody's connected i'm talking to one bad guy now like i'll talk to him later today and he had five different phones working mm. and different phones for different people and with encrypted messaging it's pretty hard to keep up on a guy like that and then with yeah. cars they would pick up a car halfway across the country and then you just don't know that these guys are coming in you're getting a lot of hits though that they're not as efficient as they used to be a long time ago i talked to a guy who killed five people for frank catroni who was part of the group before the risottos and there's a very definite way he was supposed to do it he's supposed to hit him in the body then get him behind the ear and now it's people racing by in a car, spraying out the window and missing half the time. <laughs> More like the modern street gang drive-by shooting mode of murder. Uh? Yeah, and it's more dangerous for you and me because no, chances of bystanders go way up. The old way, unless you were standing beside the guy, you didn't have that much to worry about. Yeah, that was always the mafia way. First thing, you try to isolate the person, get their best friend to set them in some place that nobody else was around and, and do it that way. So that's they've come a long ways from the, the, the good old days of, of the way to assassinate a rival. But now they'll get 
someone to put a GPS in their vehicle and they'll yeah. see where they go. <laughs> and so I'll find out that you go to McDonald's at four in the afternoon on Thursdays and I'll be waiting there. So <laughs> the GPS just, changes a lot. Yeah, they just had one of those mob guy going through a McDonald's. Is that the one you're referring to? <laughs> Uh, no, I was actually, there's a lot of Starbucks, like a lot of these guys have the higher end. I like McDonald's coffee, but if you're willing to spend seven bucks for a cup of coffee, <laughs> Starbucks is good. Yeah. <laughs> the modern day Italian mafia. Now, how is that? Is that still Drangheta and Sicilian mafia families? Or uh, is it still got the original structure it had back in the 70s and 80s? It does, but everybody does what I do up here is trying to figure out how much it's blurred on the edges because a lot of the big attacks have been done by groups working for those guys, but not those guys. It used to be like Frank Catroni had one guy who do a lot of his hits. Now they're contracting out to 19 year olds who don't even couldn't pronounce in Drangheta, yeah. you know, but they're just told shoot the guy in the red honda with this license plate and with the internet with encrypted messaging and groups working together it makes it really really hard for police even when you catch the guy who did the killing he might not know why he did the killing he just did it for three thousand bucks or so uh, he could give up one guy like i had a threatening call from a guy to another guy here in in kansas city actually or st louis and he said, you know, what are you going to do? You can send one guy to jail, me, and that's it. What are you going to do? <laughs> and when you can only send one guy to jail and it, the buck stops right there, why they make it tough, that division of labor. It's really tough for police. And you have to have people who are good on the internet. Like the smart ones are out there on the internet. And, and there's a lot of money to be made where you don't have to kill people. And so you're not going to get that much of a <laughs> penalty anyway. If I fill a container car full of stolen Cadillacs, if I get caught, I'm not going to get that much time really. Yeah. And so why not? And so a lot of them are doing that sort of crime. Auto theft, the pandemic cut auto production and made it harder to get used cars. And so yeah. parts weren't being built. And so you can sell these things for two, three times as much on the other side of the Atlantic. So it makes sense to steal cars now. If you're a smart criminal, you're less drugs, more cars. Mm, interesting. Yeah. The, and the penalties aren't near what they are for drugs. So, oh, they're nothing really. You mentioned gambling now in Canada, as opposed to the United States, that's been the mother's milk for the mob ever since bootlegging ended. You know, they went right into gambling, started out with carpet joints and illegal casinos and the race wire. Then they go into sports gambling. And of course, in Canada, big hockey country and is the sports gambling about hockey and baseball and or canadian football or is it about american football how does that work it's about pretty well anything and it's super bowl would be the big you know that would be the ultimate one so i mean i bet there's a lot of, of betting on women's soccer last week like the yeah. it's sort of anything some of these guys if you had two turtles you know on a, <laughs> put them on a table they'd bet on it like they just want to bet and so i don't think it's as much the event as they want to gamble and oh i know one guy who outside of toronto who's i mean he makes his living gambling and it's just on everything some people just like the rush of gambling and you can bet on is the next car going to be green or red and you'll get someone to take your bet <laughs> does the bob family like are they organized like for sports gambling like just for maybe football or like in Kansas City, I'm just only can relate it to what my own experience here in Kansas City are really highly organized around football all the way up to and including the Super Bowl and this international way to lay off bets. If you got your books out of balance, so to speak, and, and you wanted to lay off some bets to another city so you could balance it up. Do they do traditionally that kind of a thing, the mafia? Yeah. And some of it's just your casino stuff, like the roulette wheels and that sort of thing. There was a huge police project in Toronto and it fell apart because it was too huge. It's a tricky one for police because if you do these mega projects, then the other side can drag it out. And here, if it doesn't get to trial quick enough, then it all falls apart and the case is over. So you get a series of good lawyers who are good at delaying and then it all falls apart. Yeah. And so it's tricky for police because it means you have to bail out on something just or else parcel it off and make it a bunch of separate cases. And it's a bonanza for lawyers because you don't have to win the case. You just have to delay the case. 
Uh, interesting. Well, a constant game of cat and mouse between organized crime and law enforcement. I know that. They're pretty slippery sometimes. Yeah, now with the internet and with pretty good privacy, uh, like there's something I want to check out, but I don't want to go on the internet and go into this chat room because I don't want these guys following me. But you can actually buy where different cars are, like addresses. So I want to steal a Toyota Highlander. I can get here six places you might get one, and I'll pay a certain <laughs> amount of money to get that. So people are wow. selling, selling. And what do you, if you're police, how do you yeah. prosecute that? Yeah. Like yeah. the guy's not going to get much for it. That's tough. I knew a professional auto thief here in Kansas City, and and he would just drive around. He would get orders from body shops for different types of cars, and they'd want front ends or doors, and or he just know that something was had more value than the other. And he just drive around apartment complexes, spot the car, and then get his guy to go steal the car. And then he had another place out in the country where he would strip it, and then he had somebody else that would take it wherever the body shop was that wanted to buy the parts, he always chopped them up. But now you just go on the internet and buy about 10 addresses for <laughs> different types of well, cars. Well, and then they, <laughs> they have these, the key fobs, like for opening your door without putting a key in. Yeah. Uh, a good one can duplicate that in 15 seconds on some cars. Right. And so uh, there's certain cars that are more susceptible, but like now the, the police chief for Toronto is on TV this morning telling people to put their key fobs in little bags so that they can't pick up the signals from them that quickly but huh. it's kind of mind-bending i mean when you're buying a car next time i buy a car i'll be looking through my research about what got stolen more for some reason bmws yeah. get stolen less than range rovers if you have a high-end <laughs> car <laughs> well i'll have to do that too i'm kind of getting in need of one <laughs> maybe my last new car I ever buy but i'm kind of in need of one i'll have to think about that it's really interesting about the internet stuff and i've been hearing this People are telling me in Kansas City, oh, he said, these new young guys, he said, they live in these houses more expensive than it doesn't like they don't do anything. And it's internet. It's internet. And I don't really know what other kind of internet things are they doing out there? They put got ransomware. Are they getting people who work with them that have skills and can do ransomware and things like that? Or what kind of crimes are and they some committing? Of the, some of it's the old crimes, but they're just connected on the internet and hiding on the internet uh, and so you've still got to show an income to revenue canada like to the tax man and so you want something with a cash business where you can claim to have made amount of money that's not really verifiable so tow trucks is a great one for them they, they love tow trucks tattoo stuff but you're not going to get filthy rich off that construction that's the ultimate one you have to be pretty high end but the guy i was talking about the hell's angel whose place was just burned down he was in construction as well a lot of these guys if you want a house built north of toronto there's a chance you'll bump into them hmm. Interesting. yeah it's not just a couple shady things here and there some of it's pretty mainstream business there's some areas where if you have a bakery you know good luck Hmm. then they intimidate competition and yeah and just you don't really need to make a big profit because you're there to have enough to generate a phony, phony oh, income I, statement okay. so i mean at my tow truck company i can be great or i can be bad but nobody knows how many trucks i towed or how I, many cars i towed or a bakery nobody knows how many donuts i sold i see and that's to hide the money that's being made off the internet yeah, and, and the money off the drugs. Like you make, drugs. it's still like the lifeblood is drugs and cocaine okay. from Mexico, okay. but you got to be able to hide that. Okay, I got you now. I just thought of a, all of a sudden it slipped my mind in that kind of that, that whole subculture of narcotics and dealing with the cartels. And it's just gotten so sophisticated between the Italians, the bikers, and the cartels. It just makes it almost impossible to do anything about. And I guess Chinese are bringing a lot of fentanyl into probably Vancouver. Yeah, it's funny because the internet cuts down on, on racial lines. like you, yeah. So you can connect with someone far away. Also, it means I can take a bit of a risk with you because if I'm trying to pull you into a crime, you don't know my name anyway. Yeah. Like there's one story i worked on where one guy had three different names and it, closer you got to him you know you got a different name once you got fairly close once you got really close you got another name and once he got in trouble then there was another name again and the guy i'm talking to you later today who had the five different phones you know different phones for different people and different levels of security it's a 
really, really tricky one for police. And once we get more into artificial intelligence, good luck for police. Like, how do you even prove? If you pick up a voice on the phone, how do you prove it's that voice? Yeah, really. I was just looking at Some our... lawyer's going to make a lot of money. Some lawyer's <laughs> yeah. going to be buying a nice cottage out of that pretty, pretty soon. <laughs> yeah, and it's really hard for the law to keep up with technology. is almost impossible. Society is having a hard time keeping up with technology and the laws is even slower moving than society in general. And to keep up with technology, it's always ahead of the law. That's for sure. Yeah. And it's amazing the market there is like, it's amazing how many people are buying this stuff. And like the Hells Angels in Canada are almost always in a university town because they know kids buy drugs. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, those are supposed to be the smart kids, but they're the ones buying the drugs. <laughs> yeah, young people are the ones buying drugs till they get older. And then they realize they're either going to go on be an addict or they're going to straighten out and go on and be a successful person. Or else they get killed off no, by fentanyl get killed, along the way. Yeah, like, really. Yeah, the fentanyl changes things too, because it means if I was bringing in cocaine and I had lower grade cocaine and a lot of it got intercepted, I could fake it with fentanyl with some people, like uh -huh. just goose it up that way. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's a really, really tricky police one. It's like whack-a-mole or squeezing a balloon or yeah. something. Oh, you yeah. know, it's interesting to watch, but I wouldn't want the job. <laughs> oh, I did that. I was a soldier in Ronnie <laughs> Reagan's war on drugs. It is, it's impossible. I mean, during the crack, what we call the epidemic of crack cocaine in the 90s, it was crazy. It was just so much drugs coming in and so much money. And I mean, everybody was selling. Everybody could make a little extra income selling. And I don't know. It was just crazy back then. And I so on the demand is, I'm amazed how high the demand is. I've never once had to write about someone who imported cocaine and couldn't sell it because no one wanted to buy it because everybody's too healthy. I've n I never once had someone stuck with a warehouse full of cocaine. They can always dump the stuff. Yeah, that's a good one. That is a good one. I'm going to have to use that. Oh, yeah, you can have it. I mean, you, but you think, how many separate decisions does it take to use a ton of cocaine? Like how many separate times does a person have to decide to stick that up their nose? That's quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I know. The mobs always traded off addiction, you know, whether it be sex, gambling, alcohol, drugs, addictions, where it is. And you got this constant supply of steady customers. So it'll always be some kind of addiction that organized crime makes their money off of. Oh, yeah. If everybody just acted as healthy as they pretend to be, you know, the mob <laughs> would go to business tomorrow. I, I actually... I talked to one guy who was a biker drug trafficker once who flipped around and he said that there was enough sky for everybody and they don't have to go to war for addicts yeah. because there's enough addicts for everybody. And he <laughs> compared it to there's enough sunshine for everybody. And it was very cynical, but it was very true. Like yeah. he said, why do we fight for drug turf when we can just expand it? And he was right. Yeah. I mean, it's not exactly uplifting yet. But his big thing was, why kill your rival? Why not just work with them or expand the market? And a right. lot of them do that now. There's a yeah. lot less racism now than there used to be because groups are just working together. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, it's kind of The like... internet kind of cuts racism, but it makes better criminals too. Huh. A kind of a double-edged sword, I guess you would call that in a way. <laughs> kind of like yeah. the old yeah. uh, Frank Costello, Lucky Luciano days. Hey, guys, let's just work together and make money here. We don't need to kill each other off. <laughs> well, and then for police, how can they possibly legislate morality? Like, how yeah. can the police chief yeah. legislate everybody's decision about their health? I mean, it's just not going to happen. Yeah, you can't. What about, I guess, what we're talking about, Canadian organized crime? What about the Chinese, the Tongs, or triad societies? That stuff's still around, but it's lower profile, and what there is doesn't need to be as splashy. A while ago, about 30 years ago, there was quite a bit when there were different groups coming in, and some of the older groups were fighting with some of the newcomers. Now it seems to have blended, and like the guy I'm talking to today, he was part of something called the United Nations, and that was a gang that took in every group. And mm -hmm. so you could be from those groups or any other group. And if you were a moneymaker, then they wanted you because you gave them more ways of bringing things into the country and you gave them more markets. And so the smart one, the sort of the short answer is the smart ones work together or else are extremely airtight where people just can't get in. Does Canada have a legalized casino gambling like we do oh, like okay. on Indian reservations or... Oh, we've got them all over the place, and oh. there's ads on TV, and you can watch some celebrity telling you to okay. gamble. But 
then there's still more money. These guys can still make money having their own casinos on the side, just like we've got legalized marijuana. But I just wrote on the weekend about a pot shop where if you sell your own stuff and you're not as strict on the quality, yeah. you undercut the prices and you don't pay your taxes, you'll do well. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I figure that's probably, we just legalized marijuana here in my state and I figure that's still going on. Plus you don't have to go find a shop, go for, see your buddy down the street or go to your local bar or whatever, where your old dealer hangs out. And it's pretty expensive, I understand, in these shops. So you're not going to really save any money. Now they're taxed quite a bit too. So a lot of them don't want to pay the tax. So they're, yeah. they'll pretend they've got a legal pot shop, but they don't. They'll be buying the illegal stuff and putting it, sneaking in <laughs> into what's supposed to be a legal shop. Yeah, those uh, gray area businesses, even when something's legalized. And the mob always liked those gray area businesses. There's always susceptible to corruption and getting around the rules and not paying the taxes. So that's another source of income for the mafia families. I'm like, one last thing, I guess. Has it been like a Italian mafia war going on up there? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I'm trying to sort that out because it's got the Hells Angels mixed in. But can you tell us a little bit about that? What the conflict is, who it's between? A lot of it's over gambling. Who gets to control gambling in Montreal? The Hells Angels seem to be getting along with the Toronto mob and the leftovers of the Rizzuto family, which was just absolutely huge up here. They're under attack. There's a lot of back and forth between Toronto and Montreal, and there's a lot of biker involvement. I mean, that and Carth after the two things I put most of my time into, and everybody kind of has an idea, but it's not totally strict. Like you don't know who's crossed the line and they're working with the other group and some people mm -hmm. float back and forth and some people are just waiting for a winner. But yeah, every two or three weeks, someone gets shot in Toronto where it's got a Montreal connection and you're trying to sort it out and there's some street gang guy in the middle. Oh, interesting. All right. One other question. Did you ever see the series Intelligence? No. Can which, the Canadian I I, series, it was good. It was good. <laughs> I, I was in the series called Bad Blood, which yeah, uh, on Netflix, I was really happy with that. And it was funny because some mob guys talked to me about that. And one widow of a murdered mob guy at first was angry about it. And then she bonded with the female character and then she became a big fan. <laughs> it was, <laughs> and, and then you get all these guys popping up saying they want to tell their stories but they don't really want to tell their story because yeah. they'd have to tell the bad stuff like yeah. you'd have to tell all the bad things you did they want to all just be al pacino looking profound <laughs> you know <laughs> <laughs> that's true yeah that bad blood was a good one too that intelligence it was kind of a short-lived series two seasons but it really showed the law enforcement aspect of it, as well as the biker gangs and the marijuana dealer and, and dealing with the different blended kind of gangs in, in Vancouver. It was so believable from the police standpoint, because I've been there and, and they really did a good job at it. And they made the big pot dealer a pretty sympathetic character, too, which helps. But it was really good. It's funny because BC is, is very, very interesting. It's kind of on the other side of the country and they yeah. don't get that much attention because there's not that much media and they don't have the big mafia names. But I've been um, looking a lot at BC because a lot of the things that get done in Toronto are because of BC. I mean, I'm not telling tales out of school. There's one guy I'm trying to get more about who a really, really good source says that he's convinced this guy killed 15 people in eastern Canada and he's from BC and... Mm -hmm. He was just so good at it that he didn't leave a bleeding body on the street. I think he might have been poisoning them. Mm. So you bring someone in from BC and they rent a car for the last couple of hundred miles of the trip. Um, how are police ever supposed to know who that is? Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, they make it tough. All right. Yeah, it's a tough one for police. I mean, it's going to keep people like you and me and organized crime cops <laughs> yeah. in business. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> Never ending source. Uh, I'm glad to see something's kind of... Firing back up. It was uh, in Kansas City, it's pretty well dead. There's stuff going on, but it's on such a down low thing that it's hard to get a handle on. And 
down here, law enforcement doesn't care anymore. The FBI doesn't even have an organized crime squad, where at one time it was the biggest squad in the 70s. And when I was yeah, in the Yeah, I don't think Giuliani helped, helped that too much. <laughs> no, really. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then Sam Gravano's got his own internet show, I think. <laughs> I know, so. <laughs> I know. <laughs> how do you figure? How you, Rudy Giuliani has got a mugshot, and Sammy the Bull Gravano has got his own <laughs> stuff. He really success him and Michael Francis got really successful <laughs> internet shows. Now go figure that one. <laughs> one thing just sort of it I know you're winding down, but one thing I'm watching for that I think we'll see in the future is more woman. Oh, like really? one I was chatting with this week. She's very, very smart, and yet she didn't know how her husband or her boyfriend got her the new car and she got mad at him because it was the wrong color. But <laughs> he all of a sudden had money that for anniversary gifts he's giving her eighty thousand dollar cars and there's a lot of women up here. They don't quite have the ego that the men do. And so instead of thumping their chest, when they get caught, they cry and say, I never knew I was connected to him because of love. You know, I was blinded yeah. by love. I'm getting, a, I'm seeing a lot of this blinded by love stuff. Which... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty good way out of it, isn't it? <laughs> oh, yeah. Get a, dumb, get a dumb guy to do the heavy lifting and then cry. I mean, it's, it's not a bad thing. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> it is interesting. Have you ever interviewed a, guy, a Canadian guy? You know that story. They did a movie, kind of a big Hollywood kind of movie about his life. He was a small time heroin addict and dealer. And a guy set him up with a RCMP. And then they wanted him to go to Southeast Asia and do a big heroin deal. And he couldn't really do it. He wrote a book. His name is Alan de Leon. And uh, um, no, but I, I mean, it's that's a really interesting one. Like, I it is. They did I, some really good, really good undercover operations, like stuff out of movies. Yeah, really. This was too. I think they bit off a little more than they could chew and push the window of the envelope, according to him. I had him on the show. He was a really interesting guy, has an interesting story. There's one guy a long time ago who we were talking about the Catronis and there was a family, the Violis, and the mob guy, he was cheap enough that he had an ice cream shop and there was an apartment above it. And so an undercover cop moved in there, pretended he just broke up with his wife. They became yeah. friends. When that became public, the mob guy was murdered because he let a cop into the group. And it was a tough one for the cop because he did a great job, but when you're faking being friends with someone after a while, you <laughs> yeah. sort of become friends. And he, and the mob guy was nice to him. Like he was counseling him on his fake marriage breakup about being nice to him. And so when he heard the guy was killed, it was in an odd way rough for him, even though he, he said we were both doing our jobs and I did my job better than he did his job. So yeah. that's why he got killed. But it wasn't an easy thing for him. There are a lot of odd little things where he had to really, really act. He said he was an electrician and the mob guy uh, played around with the light bulbs in his apartment to see if he could fix it. And yeah. um, there are a lot of little games going on. But some of the best police work we don't hear about because it's done so quietly. And some of the computer stuff, I'm just not smart enough to know what they're doing. But yeah. they're doing some interesting things. Uh, yeah, that's true. Because if, if you don't have some big splash at the end, nobody ever knows. Or maybe what you do is really good is from law enforcement standpoint. But what that does, it leads you into something else that somebody else then takes over and nobody really knows even how it started. I saw that all the time here. Yeah. And in the media, we're triggered by the victim. Like the reason we've done so much about the Hells Angels is because they killed an 11 year old boy. And then for me oh. personally, a friend of mine who I did a book with, he got shot by uh, seven times by someone connected to the Hells Angels. So that gives you a grudge against them. Oh, really? Huh. Yeah. If we don't have the big victim, then the story kind of fades away. And so that's where auto theft, where people think the insurance company is going to pick up the problem. Yeah. I mean, you and I pay more for insurance because of this. And we, we pay more when we rent a car because of this. So yeah. it's not victimless, but it's not like some kid who's killed or some woman who's a bystander who yeah. gets shot. Got your friend that, that got killed by somebody connected to the Hells Angels that you'd written a book about. It. Was it directly connected to that somehow, or did he um, did he like get one. too close to somebody? And it was odd because he got shot seven times, but they didn't kill him. And then oh, yeah. he and then he he was going to retire, and then he was tough enough, Michel Auger, that he didn't want them to think that they made him retire, and so he okay. stayed on the job longer. 
Like they actually pushed him to work about two years longer. <laughs> and then I remember talking to one Hells Angel in Ontario and he was trying to be friendly. And I said, you guys shot a friend of mine. Why should I be friendly with you? And he said, no, 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 no. That guy's brave. That was Quebec that did it. It was considered over the line and it brought a huge amount of attention to them. And it's maybe something, it's an odd one for the media, but the media was a lot more active that we either don't cover this stuff or we cover it better. And so that pushed up the level of crime coverage. It was kind of odd because a guy got shot in the 70s named Charbonneau. He went into politics and became a big deal. So if they take it too far and shoot the wrong person, it actually swings back on them. I kind of use that. Like if I'm talking to a bad guy every now and then, I'll remind them that something bad happens to me, that <laughs> the paper, you just saved them having to lay me off. <laughs> but, yeah, but really, they'll, pre- they'll pretend they're a lot more upset than they probably are. <laughs> yeah, see, we always depended on that, that even today I depend on that. Somebody gets mad at you and I have relatives get mad at me and send me emails or make nasty comments about, what I'm talking about, one of their relatives or their long dead relatives many times. But we always depended on that, that the heat that will come down as a result of any action against a cop or a newsman or something, the heat that will come down is not worth the trouble that, to do any harm to you, even think about it. I know if I'm talking to a bad guy, I'll say I'm not worth 25 years or I'm <laughs> flattered if you think I'm worth 25 years. Really? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They've, they've long forgot about the investigative reporters association out of the Don Bowles killing down in Arizona. I don't know if you remember that. But oh, yeah, yeah, that was it. Yeah, yeah. Up here, a lot of it, it's kind of odd, too, because some of the bad guys don't really mind me doing what I'm doing because you need a scorekeeper. Like, you need someone <laughs> to, like, like yeah. they, they don't know what's going on either, like they sort of do, but it's almost like you're watching a parade through a little hole in the fence. You only see a bit of it. Uh-huh. And so they kind of are curious too. I had uh, once two guys in one mob family were furious at me, but their uncle liked me and he didn't like his nephews, but he'd never say it publicly. <laughs> and so he kind of in an odd way looked out for me with, you know, unofficially. And I remember there was a funeral where I said, I'm not going to go because those guys will be there. And he said, don't worry about it. You know, they won't. And I know they won't. And don't worry. And it's sort of odd because people are a lot more complicated than yeah. we give them credit for. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. I've gotten to know a couple of guys, and one in particular I've become really good friends with that was basically an associate and did some time, did a bunch of time, really, and came back out, straightened out his life, and we become friends. And he talks, and he still knows a lot of guys who are kind of really closer to life. And you realize how, how everybody have wives and families. And it's one thing that's always found interesting about organized crime is they have this whole other life and then they go to work, <laughs> which is yep. this other life, this whole dichotomy that was just almost hard to believe sometimes. Yeah. And they, a lot of them want the, their kid to do something different. Yeah. Like the guy that I knew in this one family, his, he had a daughter instead of a son and she did really well in university he couldn't have been prouder but he liked it that she was going in a different direction like he thought that his generation it was a lot tougher than it is now or a lot different and so i mean there there used to be signs no dogs or italians yeah. out on the beach in canada and yeah. so it, he said it was a different world then than it is now that there was a lot of discrimination after world war ii that we don't really get now or the, yeah. you know, that Italian people don't get now. So he wasn't apologizing for what he did, but he didn't want the next generation to do it either. Uh, yeah, interesting. Plus, if the only way to make money more is in drugs, and the sentence is so draconian that you lose somebody for a long time. Plus, it's dangerous. That drug world's dangerous, boy. Like you oh, said, yeah. you, and you, you don't doesn't need to be, like you say, but it's dangerous. Yeah, you just start a rumor about someone and that's enough to kill them. And yeah. there's one murder I covered where four different groups chipped in on a drug shipment. Then when it gets really close to Toronto, they figure out that if it's only three groups, they're going to get a lot more money. So they just kill <laughs> off one of them. <laughs> Sounds like a TV show there. That's a, that's oh, yeah. a TV series in the making right there. <laughs> <laughs> but it's sort of natural if all of a sudden you're going to get hundreds of thousands more by creating a rumor about some guy that you don't really like that much anyway. Yeah, yeah. You know, then it it streamlines it. You know, that's one less person to squeal on you, and it's more money for you. Yeah, that's a cold world. I know that. That's a cold, oh, hard world, do. that drug world. Yeah, people don't retire happy generally, right? With that. <laughs> no, they don't. And I tell you, you look in the newspaper, a lot of these little 
murders are drug ripoffs is all they are. Right? You can read between the lines. And so we talk about this huge spike in homicides in Kansas City. Well, if you start reading the newspaper articles, that's a drug ripoff. That's a drug yeah. ripoff. They never report it like that, but it is. I can promise you it is. Well, see, if someone gives me a batch of drugs and I say, well, I've got to go test them. And so I pretend I'm going off to test them and I just don't pay the person. Then what's yeah. he going to do about it? Yeah, what's he going to do? And so if, if he's a hell's angel, then he's going to do something and he's got people who will help him do something, which yeah. is why you'd want to be a hell's angel. But if he's a, an average guy, he's kind of stuck unless he, like, what is he going to do? And so they're people who they just call them jackers up here and they're like full-time jackers and yeah. they go around just ripping people off. Yeah. That's and a, then I'd hijack it and sell it to someone else. And so the other criminals kind of like me because I'm giving them discount drugs. <laughs> <laughs> it's a crazy world, but it provides work for guys like me and you, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah and it's sort of weird. In my job, I just stumbled into this stuff, but uh, it just goes on forever. Like you never run out of ideas and you never think, oh, I've heard it all now. Like there's always <laughs> something where your head's kind of shaking. <laughs> really? <laughs> All right, Peter Edwards from Toronto, Canada, Mafia Reporter. I really appreciate you coming on the show, Peter. This has been fun. Oh, that was fun, and you, you obviously really know your stuff. I really enjoyed that. <laughs> well, good. Let me do a little ending stick here, and I want to talk to you a minute. Okay. Well, guys, you all know that I like to ride motorcycles, so watch out for motorcycles when you're out there on the streets. And if you have a problem with PTSD and you've been in the service – Go to the VA website and get that hotline number. There's help available. If you have a problem with drugs or alcohol, Anthony Ruggiano, he has a YouTube channel, and I think he has his own website. And he has a hotline number on that website, and he does alcohol and drug counseling down in Florida. So if you want to go into treatment, you maybe have a real ex-mob guy be your counselor, which I think is pretty interesting. So be sure and like and subscribe and give me a review once in a while. And look down in the show notes for links to... Peter Edwards' other work. So thanks a lot, guys.